本周一，五月六日，特斯拉和 SpaceX 首席执行官埃隆·马斯克出席了二零二四年尼尔肯研究院全球峰会，并与著名投资者、尼尔肯研究院主席迈克尔·尼尔肯进行了对话。在这次持续半小时的对话中，马斯克谈的话题包括殖民火星、反对监管。在太空中使用人工智慧，以及担心人类文明消失等，也谈到自由言论、社会主义和资本分配，以及监管对创新的影响等政治和经济问题。总的来说，马斯克的这个最新谈话题材广泛，展望了一个既充满挑战又充满机会的未来。A conversation with Elon Musk. The real title of this panel was. How to save the human race and other like topics? A conversation with Elon Musk. And so, before we begin, Elon, I thought we might want to go back in time, 11 years when you were sitting on this stage. So, 11 years ago, Elon was talking about the things that will have the biggest impact on the future of humanity. And so, let's run that. Video of eleven, almost eleven years ago. I guess when I was in college, the, I, I thought about things that would most affect the future of humanity, and, and there were three areas that I thought would have the biggest impact, and those were the internet, sustainable energy, of which solar power is the production side, and electric cars the consumption side, and then humanity becoming a multi-planet species. And so we cut that short, but there was two others you talked about. One was modifying the human genome. Yeah, I'm just. I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying that's the thing would really affect、uh, the future. And next, a so a lot of people <laughs> didn't weren't thinking about these same five things when they were in school, particularly humanity on multi planets at that time. I five was certainly thinking about it, but I think at some point we want to make science fiction not fiction forever. And、uh, yeah, let's make life multi planetary and be a space faring civilization, be out there among the stars. I think th- th- there are things that. Uh, you have to be excited about the future. Life cannot just be about solving one problem after another. There have to be things that 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 really move your heart and that make you excited to wake up in the morning. And I think being a, becoming a space-faring civilization is one of those things. If you ask kids anywhere around the world, what is what are some of the most inspiring things? You, know, you can ask a five-year-old, six-year-old anywhere in the world, and they're going to say space exploration is one of those things. And and we want to make sure that we're that Apollo is not the high water mark. In fact, you mentioned at one point that, that you wrote a letter offering to run the Apollo program. I believe. Yeah, the, <laughs> to, but but, but and we, and would have, you would have done a fantastic job. But the point is that the, the Apollo program was something that was inspiring to everyone around the world. And we, we don't want the Apollo program to be the high water mark of human exploration. And yeah, we want. I think you want to have some. Sense that the future is going to be better than the past. That we're going to be out there, going to other star systems, and、uh, in a science fiction, non-dystopian sci-fi story, of which there are not many, but like Star Trek. Speaking of Star Trek, a lot. When I think about you, let's look at Spock from S- Star Trek here. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship. Enterprise, your ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life forms and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. So when I think about you, I think about Spock and Captain Kirk, and you're going to take us to places we've never gone before. Yeah, that's the idea. If we send probes out there, we might we, we might find the remains of long dead alien civilizations. If, if physics is correct, the The universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Earth is about four and a half billion years old. But at 13.8 billion years, a civilization that even lasted a million years is three digits past the decimal point. And if you consider human civilization, I date it from like the first writing. So that first writing was the ancient Sumerians, archaic pre-cuneiform, around 5,500 years ago. So that is one millionth of Earth's lifespan. That's how long writing has existed. If, if we were to last as a civilization for a million years, that would be incredible, and we would actually probably be in every part of the galaxy. So that, this, is, this causes me to, to think that where are the aliens? It's the Fermi question. The, the great physicist, Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, he, he, he's like, where are they? Now a lot of people think there are aliens among us. There was I, that I, movie Men in Black. Yeah. Told us they're among us, and Elvis really went back to his own planet. 
Yeah, really a lot of people think there are aliens, but uh, I get asked that a lot. And for, for some reason, a lot of the same people who think there are aliens among us didn't think we went to the moon, which I'm like, <laughs> think about that for a second. But I think I would, I've not seen any evidence of aliens. And space, SpaceX with the Starlink constellation has roughly 6,000 satellites. And not once have we had to maneuver around a UFO. Okay. So, <laughs> so we were like, hey, what's that? Is that an alien? <laughs> Has occurred never. So I'm like, okay, I don't see any evidence of aliens. And I look at it. I, if somebody has evidence of aliens in, in a, it's not just a fuzzy blob, then I'd love to see it, love to hear about it. And, but I don't think there is, which is actually reason for concern because you could, if, if any civilization in the Milky Way, in our galaxy, were to last for a million years, even with a speed of travel that's far below the speed of light, like a few percent of speed of light, they could easily have explored and colonized the whole galaxy. So they haven't, so why not? I think the answer might be, or perhaps probably is, that civilization is precarious and rare, and that we you should really think of human civilization as being like a tiny candle in a vast darkness, and we should do everything possible to ensure that that candle does not go out. Juan, I thought one of the interesting things for the people on X viewing this session yeah. and the people in the audience here is that maybe I'd give you a few of your quotes and you can comment on them. Okay, let's start with this one. Free speech. Freedom of speech is the bedrock of democracy. Yeah. Without it, America ends. Yes, it's obviously not possible to have democratic elections if people do not have access to the information that would allow them to make the right decision on a candidate or a party. So if speech is constrained in a fundamental way, you just can't expect people to make the, the right decision or an informed decision because they are prevented from being informed. I think it's a very a foundational element. And it's, I have to say, like, why, why is free speech, freedom of speech, the, the First Amendment? It's because people came from countries where if you spoke freely, you would be imprisoned or killed. That was why they were like, you know what? We should make sure that we got that one. I remember that time when they tried, tried to kill us back in the other country just for saying we didn't like a political candidate? Let's make sure that's okay in America. And so actually in a lot of parts of the world, you can't really say, most parts of the world, you can't really say what you want to say without some bad consequences. And sometimes people forget, like, why is the Constitution there? The Constitution there is to protect the people from the government. If they're, it's to make it hard to change things. That's why the Constitution exists. Yeah. Let's, don't, let's, don't forget let's, about that. Like, let's try don't take it for granted. Let's <laughs> try the next quote. Yeah. The fundamental error of socialism is shifting capital allocation from highly effective entrepreneurs to astonishingly ineffective government. I think we'll find hearty agreement in this room. Yeah, I think that this, this is definitely um, a stack deck on that front. But yeah, the, there's, you'll hear this sort of argument like, oh, we shouldn't have some greedy corporation do it. We should have the government do it. I'm like, actually, the government is just a corporation in the limit. So if you, it, it's, a government is the corporation with a monopoly on violence. So if, if you're unhappy with a commercial corporation doing it, you should be actually very unhappy with the, the government doing it since it is simply a corporation, the most corporate thing. And you can actually e easily get, get more sway in a, in a company than you can, the outcome of a company, than you can in the government. Everyone's experienced this going to the DMV. Every said, do you want the DMV at scale? Probably not. Okay. All right. Let's, <laughs> the government let, is the DMV at scale. Let's try another one. Discriminate on the basis of anything other than merit is wrong. Yeah, I think we do need to have a merit-based system because as soon as you, you go down the path of you're going to discriminate on, on non-merit-based, then, then where do you stop? Yeah, I think we need to be as rigorous about merit as possible. And while it is, yeah, to, to me that seems like it's a foundational thing. Again, I, th I also think this room is probably supportive of, of a merit-based uh, situation. But, but yeah, that's, that, that is, yeah, I think we should be, yeah, not, not discriminated on anything other than merit. Uh, All right, good. Yeah. I'm happy you agree yeah. with yourself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> wait, who is this guy? He really uh, sounds great. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the next one. Regulation and regulatory consistency. Like Gulliver, tied down by thousands of little strings, we lose our freedom one regulation at a time. Yes. So this is actually a very important point that I think is not talked about enough, that re laws and regulations are immortal. They don't die. Humans die, but laws and regulations can last forever. If, over, if year after year there are more laws and regulations passed and more regulatory bodies 
created, eventually everything will be illegal. And that's why you see the California High Speed Rail has made a tiny section of, that doesn't even have rail on it, and for, I don't know, several billion dollars. Because everything's, at this point, California has made almost everything illegal. So you can't make progress. Now, the, historically, what has cleared away the cobwebs of regulation has been war. Now, we prefer not to have a war. So in order to have civilization function without war, you have to, have a, you have to actively eliminate the laws and regulations. So you have to have basically a garbage collection process for rules and regulations. That is necessary. Otherwise, you get hardening of the arteries. And over time, nothing can get done. The most poignant example that I can think of that happened this week was the, the sad picture of the California high-speed rail which is just billions of dollars spent for practically nothing. But it'll only get worse year after year. So we must have a regulatory clearinghouse garbage collection process. This is essential or civilization comes grinding to a halt. We used to have sunset, that regulation with sunset. Unfortunately, it's rare today. Yes. All right, let's talk about education. The more you can gamify the process of learning, the better. You do not need to tell your kid to play video games. No. They will play video games on autopilot all day. So if you make it interactive and engaging, then you can make education far more compelling and far easier to do. Yeah, yeah. So the, the way education works today, before there was radio and TV and movies, where every town would have their town and that would be the that would be the entertainment. Some you know in a big city you'd have much better players than say in a small city. But then along came movies and TV, and then you say like and video games where you take the the smartest best people in any arena, like whether they're acting, writing, directing, special effects. You spend tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars creating a great movie or a great video game, and you make it as compelling as possible. Imagine you're not in New York. Imagine you're in Bakersfield, okay? Then you, and you got, instead of Batman being like the Nolan Brothers, it's Batman the, the Bakersfield acting troupe. It wouldn't be as good. That's how teaching works today. What you actually want to have is an interactive learning experience that is as compelling as possible, and you do not want to act, you do not actually want a teacher in front of a board doing a board bull act. You want it to be engaged, real-time feedback. And then there are a few other principles in, in, in teaching. You have to establish relevance, otherwise your mind will want to forget things. So our mind is constantly trying to forget as much as possible. So you'll only remember things if your mind can establish re relevance or there's a strong emotional element to it. Otherwise, you're going to basically going to forget everything. Memory is very expensive from an evolutionary standpoint, so it's trying to forget as much as possible. So when teaching a course, you, you, you have to explain to kids why it's important. And then you want to teach to the problem instead of teaching the tools. So what I mean by that is if you said, here's a car engine, we're going to try to understand how, to, how this car engine works. We're going to take it apart. So what do we need to do to take it apart? We need a wrench, we need some screwdrivers, we need a hoist and a pulley, and we're going to take it apart and we're going to see how it all works. That's engaging. And along the way, you learn about wrenches and screwdrivers and all the tools that are needed that's, that actually is engaging and compelling. But the way teaching more typically works is we're gonna teach you a course on screwdrivers and a course on wrenches. And you're like, why do I have a, a course on wrenches? It's not obvious. That would be like, say, a course on calculus without explaining what calculus is used for. And then you, you forget it. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of work to do in that area. Let's talk about a, a non-controversial issue, immigration. Sure. Uh, here is Elon on immigration. I'm very much in favor of increased and expedited legal immigration for anyone who is talented, hardworking, and honest. Bizarrely, it's difficult and agonizing slow to immigrate to the U.S. legally, but it's trivial and fast to enter illegally. This yeah. obviously makes no sense. Once again, I agree with that guy. If anyone here has been through the legal immigration process, I've been, been through it, it's only gotten worse since 9-11 and with COVID. It's, it's, an, it's a sort of Kafka-esque, very long, bizarre process to immigrate legally to the US. I have friends of mine who, they can't get their wife to have a green card. It's like insane. 
On the other hand, it's, you can hop across the water in the south. It's just like very easy. I went to the water myself just to see what's going on. Is this real or is this propaganda or real? And so I just went there and I'm like, oh, it is real. Okay, this is crazy. We've got situations where people are pouring across the, like it's World War Z. I'm like, this doesn't seem healthy. So I'm like, are we checking anyone here? Or like, what's going on? And you know, it does not say that I'm a big believer in immigration, but to have unvetted immigration at large scale is a recipe for disaster. So I'm, I'm in favor of greatly expediting legal immigration, but having a secure southern border so there's some vetting of who comes into the United States. I think this is just sensible. All right, let's now link Starlink to education. We're basically building the internet in space. Yeah. Why it matters? Starlink is a massive enabler for people in remote locations to learn anything. You can learn almost anything for free on the internet right now. For example, MIT has all of its lessons online. That's if you have internet. If you don't, you're limited to books. It might be the number one technology that improves people's standard of living around the world, Starlink. Yeah, absolutely. So once you have access to the internet, you have access to all the world's information. But if you don't have access to the internet or it's too expensive, or low bandwidth, then you cannot access the MIT lessons, you can't access all the information, and you can't sell the goods and services that you produce. So internet connectivity, I think, is, I think it might be certainly a candidate for one of the things that would do more to lift people out of, poverty, out of poverty than anything else, because they can now sell their goods and services, they can learn anything, and, but without connectivity, they cannot. I think Starlink will actually like move the GDP of countries. It's gonna be that kind of thing, because what is GB, GDP is a, is a function of average productivity per person, and so if there's a technology that improves productivity per, per person, you would expect to see that actually reflected in the gross domestic product. All right, civilization is fragile. I think it is. We should always regard civilization as fragile. Yeah. There is not an inevitable upward trajectory. A lot of civilizations have risen and fallen in recent years. Yes. I suspect most people in this room have actually read history, but if you haven't, I strongly recommend it. It sounds obvious, but there's been so many civilizations that have risen and fallen, many that we just don't have much of a record of. I mentioned the ancient Sumerians. Their language was forgotten for a long time until it was finally decoded only in the last, I don't know, two, three hundred years, but like it's not in something, in the 1800s, I think. But it's been very recent, so for several thousand years, nobody understood what those tablets meant. and. Uh, because they're, the, they're the ruins of a long dead civilization. And there, there are many long dead civilizations. At some point, our civilization will come to an end too. We just don't want it to be anytime soon. So. You've been quoted a number of times, yeah. Elon, on you'd like to die on Mars, but not on landing. Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was asked that in, a, in an interview if I wanted to die on Mars, but then I considered the corner case of dying on impact. And I was like, except for that case, you've got to consider the various corner cases. If, I'm gonna, if you're going to die somewhere, might as well be Mars. I'd like to explore for a bit before dying. But yeah, I think, I think we want to be a multi-planet civilization. And I think... I don't know if that's, that's a response to the audience. <laughs> Let's talk about that just for one second. Then we're sure. going to take some questions from the I audience. I could accomplish this actually this year if I, if I was willing to die on impact. The fundamental invention that is necessary for humanity to become a multi-planet species is rapidly reusable, reliable, Rockets. Yeah, I was trying to sound like a pirate. R R R R R. But yeah, rapidly reusable, reliable rockets. Space pirates for the win. All um, right, here's some questions so, from the audience. Which one would you like to pick here? Let me maybe just touch upon why I think making life multiplanetary is important because I think it's one of the things that gets us past one of the Fermi great filters. So in in trying to explain why do we not see aliens. There are various explanations for why we don't see aliens. What stopped those civilizations from expanding beyond their solar system? And what were the sort of sometimes called like Fermi filters? If you don't become a multi-planet civilization, then you're simply waiting around until you, you die from a self-inflicted wound or from some, some natural disaster like the dinosaurs. Get hit by a big meteorite or something like that. Eventually something like that's going to happen. And if, if you wait a lot around long enough, the sun will expand to engulf Earth and will be incinerated. So that for sure is going to happen. Now, we, we've, got a, we've got some time before that happens. We, there are more near-term risks. But we want to try to get past the Fermi filter of being a single planet civilization. Now, this is, gonna, this is also 
this is going to be somewhat cerebral to many people listening, but, if, but I think this is, pretty, this is actually very important. We want to get past the Fermi filter of a single planet civilization. The point is not to, to move from Earth to another planet and let Earth die. That's not what I'm saying at all. I want to be a multi-planet civilization so that we have planetary redundancy such that no single event can, end, can be the end of our civilization. That is the point of making life multi-planetary. So let's take a couple questions from the audience. How does AI affect and how will it affect our daily lives? I mean, AI might be the most important question of all. The, the, the percentage of intelligence that is biological grows smaller with each passing month. Eventually, the percentage of intelligence that is biological will be less than 1%. The, that's actually not what, we just don't want that is brittle. If the AI is somehow brittle, silicon circuit boards are, don't do well just out, out in the elements. So I think biological intelligence can serve as a, a backstop, as a buffer of intelligence. But almost all, in, as a percentage, almost all intelligence will be digital. So then, it's, what role will there be for us? I don't know. I do think, I think it's very important that we build the AI in a way that, that is beneficial to humanity. And there's some important principles here, because I've thought about AI safety for a very long time. I think you want to have a maximum truth-seeking AI. This is very important. The AI should not be taught to lie. It should not be taught to say things that are not true. Even if those things are politically incorrect, it should still say that what it believes to be true. The entire plot of 2001 Space Odyssey, the reason that, that HAL 9000 killed the astronauts was because it was forced to lie. I don't know if most people realize that. That's what Arthur C. Clarke was trying to say. Don't make the AI lie. The AI was told that the, that the astronauts could not know the secret of the monolith, but also that it must take them to the monolith. The solution, take them to the monolith dead. And it was very important to have a maximum truth-seeking AI and, and a maximally curious AI. And I think that will, that's most likely to foster human civilization because we are much more interesting than a bunch of rock. So although I think Mars, I love Mars, obviously, but you could render Mars quite easily because it looks like a section of the Arizona desert. It's like red rocks. But the rendering complexity of human civilization is vastly greater by many orders of magnitude. So I think an AI would be that is truth-seeking, maximally curious, would foster human civilization to see where it, where it goes. One of the questions here, can AI accelerate your efforts in space? How do you see it being helping you and what you're trying to achieve? Oddly enough, one of the, the areas where there's almost no AI used is space exploration. So SpaceX uses basically no AI. Starlink uses does not use AI. I'm not against using it, it's just we haven't seen a use for it. I mean, w with any given variant of or improvement in AI, the, I mean, there's generally, like I'll ask it questions about the Fermi paradox, about rocket engine design, about electrochemistry, and so far the AI has been terrible at all of those questions. There's still a long way to go. So uh, let's talk about one. Here's a question that's near and dear to your heart. You have a lot of children. Yes. I'm trying to say The a good birth example. rate is down in the U.S. What needs to change so people start having more children? Yeah, this, this question has troubled me for a long time because you can look at, you can look at the demo, like demographics. It's a very slow moving ship. Who's going to be an adult in 20 years based on who was born last year? If, if you want to, I think, has, have a good approximation for population, really look at how many babies were born last year in a particular country. Multiply that by life expectancy. That's the number of people that will be adults in that country. That's the steady state population if birth rate remains constant. Now, birth rate is not constant, it is dropping. So you look at the second derivative of birth rate, and actually we see an acceleration in the, the, drop, drop, in the drop in the fertility rate. Second derivative of the fertility rate is very bad. Where does this lead? This does not lead to a greater civilization. This leads to a civilization that potentially dies not with a bag, but with a whimper in adult diapers. That is a sad ending. So obviously we have countries that, like Korea, used to have a birth rate of six. It's now three quarters. Yeah. Uh, here's a slight question for you. Do you come pick me up. I'll biggest, give you a baby, says one what of do you the, think are the... <laughs> that is one of the things that says on the screen. <laughs> I don't know if everyone heard that. You want to read it? 
It says, Elon, come pick me up. I'll give you a baby. Thank you. Um, okay. I certainly encourage everyone in this room to have at least three children. Look, this baby's got to come from somewhere. And I think we just want to have, I, I don't know, I think we want to have a slightly increasing population, not a plummeting population. I think this applies to, to all countries and cultures. Like, I don't think we want any country or culture to disappear. We want them to ideally flourish and not disappear. In, in fact, one of the things that is overlooked by probably most historians is the role of low birth rate in the decline of civilization. So around, I think it was around 50 BC, the Rome passed a bill to give a bonus to any Roman citizen that would have a third child. So this was a pro birth rate was a problem in Rome in 50 BC. The Romans weren't making Roman. The same is true of ancient Greece. There was a time from about 800 BC to 300-ish BC where the Greeks were, had a lot of kids and a lot of surviving kids. Like the birth rate far exceeded the death rate, which is why you had Greek cities popping up all over the, the Mediterranean. But then I think basically it seems to be that prosperity is, destroys the birth rate. So if when, when a civilization feels like it has no meaningful external threat and is very prosperous, that is what causes the birth rate to plummet. Somewhat counterintuitively, you think if you've got more resources, surely you, that would lead to more kids. In fact, it is the opposite. The more prosperous a civilization and the more a civilization feels that it does not need to defend against external threats, the lower the birth rate. I'd say that there's a lot of research on this. There's really been three. One, number one, prosperity, as you've said. Number two, improvements in health care. So in 1900, half the children died on the planet before their fifth. And the third was the education of women. So we've had some pretty interesting questions put up here, but let's try this one. What keeps you up at night and what gives you joy? I think kids give me joy. So I probably get the most joy from my kids. And I'm not saying that's the reason to have kids because we should have them anyway, but I, I certainly, kids are the, I, I have the greatest source of joy in my life. In terms of what keeps me up at night, I guess it's anything that's, I think, a civilizational risk. If, if we're birth rates continuing to plummet, I, like, I do think about the birth rates plummeting as being a civilizational risk. I think anything that undermines the foundations of democracy in America or elsewhere as a, a risk. I think uh, anything that's leading us away from a merit-based system is a risk. I actually spend, I listen to civil, I listen to like podcasts about the fall of civilizations to go to sleep. So perhaps that's, that might be part of the problem here. So There's that, literally a podcast called Fall of Civilizations, which <laughs> I listened to a few times. And I, I'd also recommend Hardcore History if you haven't listened to that. It's a great, it's a great podcast. I, I listen to history podcasts basically to go to sleep. So that's probably why I'm ruminating on these things as I go to sleep. Alan, I want to thank you for joining us today. And we couldn't be more excited that you agree with some of your own quotes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right.